You're listening to episode 346 of the Major Issues Podcast, and on this episode, we go back 10 years to cover the trial of Jean Grey. The Major Issues Podcast starts right now. Hello everybody out there in comic book land, my name is George Serrano, aka The Don, and if you're listening to this, you can only be here for one reason, and that's a brand new episode of Major Issues Live, brought to you each and every week by ComicBookClick.com, and as always, I am never alone, sir, if you could please introduce yourself. I am the Herald of Galacta, Gregory Thomas, aka GT Rebirth. GT Rebirth, I'm glad you took some time away from heralding Galacta? Galacta, yes. Galacta. Yes. Trying to the truly female this. one. <laughs> I'm trying to wrap my name around my 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 mouth around that name, and I'm hoping that uh, she could wrap her thighs around my. But anyway, uh, hey, he's no. he's not even alone. Other sir, if you could please introduce yourself. It's John Escudero, and I'm trying not to get killed by Galactus today. <laughs> <laughs> another, Galacta. Another, it's another good day. Did not get no, killed sorry, by no, Galactus. I don't today. want Galactus to kill me because you guys are talking about fucking Galacta. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, so uh, no. See, John, we turned we turned him back into the life bringer. It's okay. I feel like that's even worse now. He's got <laughs> he's got time to come deal with you. <laughs> does he ever put? Does he ever put back on his green space underwear? Is that ever? Yes. Happen? Wow. <laughs> That's all that matters. That's all that matters. You're being a bit harsh over there, GT. It's almost like you have us on trial out here in these streets. <laughs> you understand? And maybe that's just the mood of the day because that's exactly what we're here to talk about. The 10-year anniversary of a certain story, the trial of Jean Grey. And I'll let you gentlemen know right off the bat, I was trying to find a story that was 10 years old and that had to deal with the X-Men. And it, <laughs> I found this story. Um what I think is the most interesting is this time in Marvel is a very mm. interesting time <laughs> as they uh, are try they are coming off one of the most successful back to back like uh, you know crossover series that they were dealing with at the time and then this whole thing with like the rebranding of the X Men the this whole like uh, diminishing of them bringing them back from the past um, yeah. were you guys aware of that whole arc and what do you I guess like, what do you guys think of that gimmick of uh, bringing back the original five X Men in their younger forms because we've kind of driven the original concept of this off the cliff, <laughs> so we we're reverting back. How'd you feel about that, Yogi? I was reading at the time. I actually I have the first few uh, issues of it somewhere or in a box somewhere. Uh, it was a big deal. I remember when uh, well, all new uh, Avengers versus X Men finished and spoilers for a twelve year old book. <laughs> uh Clops kills Professor X and like George said, the whole fucking thing is 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 all out of whack by the time Bendis gets the book. And I'm not sure if they were already like had it already had efforts already begun to put the X Men away in a box in twenty fourteen. Mm. Were we here already? I wanna say. Let me look up when Avengers and uh I, mean, I had it. But while you look that up, I I had this book. I read it for I don't know, is it twenty issues? I read it yeah. all the way up to the Battle of the Atom crossover. And I dropped mm-hmm. it because I couldn't it was uh it wasn't my I, I was I the pain like, too much to bear. It just wasn't it's not that it wasn't good. I mean we, we read you guys we we'll talk about this story. You see how it was. It's all it was all just like this. Yeah, it's pretty poppy. Uh, he's quippy, fine, Hoping. funny, but uh, it wasn't really X Men. It was just Bendis having fun with some kids, and I was like, okay, well, I don't need this. Huh. It's so funny because you- I was gonna say it's funny because I dropped right, I dropped it after oh. Battle of the Atom, and then this is the damn story that takes place after that. So it's like you forced me to you finish. You dragged him back in. <laughs> About two years after this story, we'll end up dealing with stuff like Death of X and Avengers versus, I mean, you know, X Men versus Inhumans. So, you know, this is around that. I guess it's almost like the phase one of that. Um, I thought it was pretty, uh, a pretty interesting gimmick that they have like all the same onesies in different colors. 
Mm. Almost like a Power Ranger kind of <laughs> yeah. uh, branding of the X Men. Considering we were just talking about um, all new X Men and this idea that of defining them as a team and kind of creating a a uniform. But what do you guys think of the color coded, the color coded X Men? I hated it. I hate, I hate, <laughs> I hate, I hate it. I hate, 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 hate the way it looks. I hate. It. I I was thinking to myself while I was reading this book. I think I hate these costumes. <laughs> uh, I think Kitty's is the only one that looks right on her, but hers kind of looks like anything else she wears. Yeah, but, yeah. There, uh, there was... yeah. Go ahead, GT. Actually, I, I I I wanted to respond to your previous question first, which was to say, I feel like I can distill my feelings about the young time displaced X Men in a very simple sentence that was put to panel uh, in another book, which is. Cyclops explaining the entire existence of him and the other X Men to Richard Ryder, and him just going, "I hate everything that you just said." <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, I got you know what I got from this and uh, reading this. This felt like, um, like a pup named Scooby Doo, in comparison <laughs> to Scooby Doo. <laughs> and I love a pup named Scooby Doo. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like this is like a, just a more poppy, lighthearted, more snappy version of. What I read before that can get quite dire and quite, yes. quite, you know, doing things. But last time we were here yes. talking long form about an X Men book, we we're talking about uh, genocide and uh, cultural. It's the kind of show where you aren't questioning what you know Fred's actual feelings are for Daphne. Yeah, yeah, we're not. We're yeah, we're just getting past a uh, bit of that. This this made me realize that I don't know when Jean Grey came back to life. <laughs> oh, from the which, would that be from? Death? And she died. She died in Morrison's run, and then that was it. Uh, she she's even dead when we're reading this story. Uh, mm. They mentioned multiple times. And there's, I, you know, there's been uh, multiple resurrections of Dean Jean Grey, and also many deaths of Jean Grey. Uh, well, like, yeah, she, no, go ahead. She dies in New X Men. Yep, 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 yep. yep. Um, and then. The Phoenix Force tries to bring her back in Phoenix End Song in 2005 by Greg pa- Greg Pak. Yeah, uh, I remember Phoenix reading that. End Song and and then uh, Jean uh, allowed herself to be obliterated by Cyclops' optic blast. My God! To the white hot room where she remained until the Phoenix resurrected her again in uh, Phoenix Resurrection: The Return of Jean, Jean Grey in 2007. So that's like for the long she was gone for like ten ten years. Uh, ten years, uh, long as time. Roughly, and then you know she comes back for House of X, but then she dies in that too. Yeah, but they always, but by that point they can do the resurrection thing. I think all the X Men have died now, like multiple times over. <laughs> yeah, but on um, this hot room, that's a name. This is the baby Hitler paradox, right? They this this entire story hinges on this idea that somebody's going to do something really really bad in the future, and whether or not we, with that knowledge. Uh, of uh, those events are responsible for quelling that before it happens. How do you how do you guys feel about pre what is it a uh, proactive <laughs> crime fighting, aka arresting you before you've actually done it? But I know you're gonna do it, or you're supposedly gonna do it. Supposedly gonna do it. Like this, I feel like I feel like the entire story is suggesting that that gladiator is just too uh, emotionally compromised to actually. Parse the intricacies of time travel. Yeah, there's he a little bit of absolutism to him. He's yeah. triggered. Yeah, yeah. 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 It kind of reminds me of when, um, in Black Panther, when Killmonger brings Wakabi Claw. You know, mm-hmm. it's like it doesn't matter how he got here. It doesn't matter who I am. This is the person you were looking for, right? Like you understand? Like yeah. you're gonna bring this person. To your people, and you're gonna look like a hero. You yeah. could be the person to stop the phoenix, like before. Well, he has no him. idea who just walked across his border. He's like, "Oh, Claw's head." No, but he they gave him exactly. Yeah, they gave him exactly what he wants. So all of a sudden, if Gladiator's able to do that, as if he's able to stop the, you know, an impending destruction, um, that seems to be all he's thinking about. But obviously, you know, he realizes the uh, problems in that uh, pretty quickly. Mr. Gladiator. But then another thing about this, like, 
We've read um, some X-Men stories here, long form. Like I said, we just covered new X-Men, and that also had a lot of the Shi'ar in it. And it almost makes me wonder how they managed to go this long without trying to adapt them. Mm-hmm. Without trying to use them in any other form. Like, I feel like Ooh, they've been a pretty big deal. <laughs> we got really close, right? They were essentially the, the, the vague, nameless alien species in the Oh, Christina or, Hendricks? Yeah. They were, they they should have been. They stepped in the place of the Shi'ar. Like they, instead of using the Shi'ar, they used this strange original concept. Like it was like, why didn't you just take the extra step? I am totally not Lelandra. It would have given Xavier something to do. I don't think he does much in that movie. <laughs> Somebody saw the costumes and they were like, eh, no. "We the budget doesn't." <laughs> what about gray? formless name what if we just make them human actually <laughs> yeah and then instead of instead of a third act of you just fighting faceless shape-shifting aliens and khakis you could have just had gladiator and some of the members of the imperial guard but they had khakis on yeah they, i remember specifically they, they were, were yeah. a lot of those. <laughs> that's great yeah i hate that uh, i hate that movie <laughs> hey you just recently it, sorry, I this you, movie. you just recently i just saw it for the sorry. first time yeah I hated. I hated. Um, oh, because you were going through it with your kid, right? Yeah, yeah. There was nothing redeeming about that. <laughs> nothing. I said, except for uh, Jennifer Lawrence's lack of enthusiasm for anything she did in it. That was just. That was. I respect how checked out she was. I was gonna say, like, like everyone would give her shit for like not caring, but then you watch the movie, and it's just like, like, no, anything else would have been a lie. We're family, Gene. Well, that's the, I that's trust the big, you. <laughs> that's the big thing is like it's um, she's checked out, and then so is Mystique. Like Mystique is over everything too, so she gets the, you know to, to, maybe she was being really method <laughs> because Mystique okay, is like yeah. oh, became like, <laughs> <laughs> oh Professor became you know the, the correct character choice right yeah 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 they was like we're just gonna write it in because she's she's saying this stuff off camera so we're just gonna write it in <laughs> it's like you know what guys maybe we should change this to X a woman do you ever think about that all right Stick Jennifer shit, hold Charles. on hold on. <laughs> They um, killed her off fast too. Like to tell you, know she didn't want to be there. But yeah, I just, I just, um, I hate, and you know, this goes into what we're gonna cover today. But I hate this idea that with the Phoenix, and this, I think it's a, I think it's a mischaracterization. But this idea that with the Phoenix, Gene has no agency. Um, okay. I think I think when people adapt it in that way, they're being misleading. I think Gene has more agency than it than it appears. Yeah. In in these uh, instances where they always make it seem like a trance or a possession, like an out and out, like she has no, she's it's gone too far. She's yeah, yeah, but she's totally driving that car. Yeah. It's a yeah. super fast car. Maybe she doesn't know how to drive it. <laughs> you know, that's a whole other question. Um, I but that, I, I, I never want to take it. From- no, I was gonna say I think that just comes from the relationship between Gene and the Phoenix being so confusing to people who don't really read comics. There's a lot going on there. As essentially, if you really dig into it, she's like her own. Like the Phoenix is Gene's mother. Like it's a whole fucking weird, confusing thing there. There's no real way to like, just explain it. And I guess that that's what makes it so difficult for for, for movie people. Well, I think. I think if you have like the one story that people are at least vaguely aware of, that one story just kind of suggests that she is possessed and lost inside of it. And then you never really, you kind of have to search for the rest of it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's our sweet little Jean, and she would never do any of these things. It was that yes. evil firebird who got her all, yes. you know, got her on the drugs. <laughs> now look. <laughs> But no, uh, I think I, as I we think found out when we watched it on the TV show, which was like, like oh hell, at least you know the bird was discerning enough to attack those uninhabited planets that had nobody on them. It's Strikers Island. It's inhabited. That's why you always go to Strikers Island, bro. It's inhabited. It's very important that everyone fight oh, on Strikers Island. <laughs> but yeah, I like when Jean has more agency in these stories where she's just not spoken about. While she's in the same room, a lot of people like to do that, <laughs> or they're like, "The Phoenix is a fucking terrible force, and we need to." She's like, "I'm right here, guys. Like, it hasn't happened yet. 
kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I overall I dug this story. To, it goes off in a bit of a clip. It, it happens. It all happens pretty pretty quickly. Um, yeah, it's a very, it's it's a fairly short story. Yeah. Uh, but if you guys are ready, we can get into this recap and review. I will say if you guys, um, I collected the, these in the reading order that I read them. I think the biggest d- distinction is I started mine with Guardians of the Galaxy 11, which will then go into all new X-Men 22 and then all new X-Men 23. Uh, whereas I believe <laughs> other reading orders are all new X-Men 22. Guardians Eleven and then all new X Men Twenty Three. It's the other reading orders, sir. It's it's on the official comic. We can't, hey hey hey, we, hey! It's in the book. When you read it's in the last page of the book, someone uh, stapled the the trade wrong. <laughs> I don't know what's going on over here. I'm not here. No, to, they I'm actually like, suck. Marvel trades suck with that uh, with that order. Sometimes I always talk about the damn Spider Verse trade that disappointed me with all yeah. the tie ins in it. But after the main story is over. Yeah, we've spoken about. Oh, yeah, that makes no. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I think that was part of Spider Geddon too, or something like that. Where I remember like what? being done with the main story and going, "Why would I care now? That like, why would I care to?" Oh, that they put the back, the the side, uh, oh, the tie-ins the, the 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 in, in the back. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm like, uh, I'm done with this story. I don't think. Yeah, it's like, and now for all that information you may have missed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not for the Groot TV show, you know. Like, if you want, if you want, <laughs> if you want to watch that. Um, By the way, right, before guys, you begin, I'd like to point out um, John's uh, very particular choice of green-haired man on his T-shirt. Oh, and then and I, the I know, I, I realized late, uh, too late. We were already, we, <laughs> <laughs> you got an invisible woman thing going on over there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to just hide my nipples. That's it. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like you guys just don't see me. Oh, <laughs> no. You think what? Susan just makes her private parts invisible when she's mad at Reed? Just in her <laughs> Can't see nothing. Can't this see nothing. Up. This is fucked up. Uh, so uh, we're going to start off in Galaxy, Guardians of the Galaxy number 11. Uh, full spoilers moving forward, and we'll be stopping to discuss how the story unfolds. But uh, we start off in nowhere and chilling at the edge of the universe. Peter Quill, a.k.a. Star-Lord, is drinking at a bar, flirting with a beautiful alien with squid-like hair. Just as things are getting interesting, his teammate Gamora, scantily clad and all business, interrupts. Annoyed, Peter asks why she's there. Gamora asks, reminds him of his father, Jay son of Spartax, has an entire Spartax army hunting him. Peter brushes it off. They're after Thanos now, not him. As they banter, Gamora reaches for his drink, and Peter realizes it's too late, and she's not really Gamora. She's a scroll bounty hunter. Drugged, Peter passes out before he can react. Uh, I feel like this would work on me. So, uh, <laughs> I'm also very much reminded of what the original design of Gamora is. It's a very striking design. <laughs> Skull. <Yeah. laughs> I don't know how those things stay in place. Yeah. Uh, that very, very scantily clad. Um, a lot of double-sided tape. I know you are a fan of Cosmic Marvel, Yogi. Were you taken aback, upset, uh, impressed with um, MCU's version of Star-Lord, given the, there was already one? The MCU's version of uh, all of the Guardians work for what the MCU does. It's a lot different from the gruff uh, war torn star lord that you kind of got in annihilation and then conquest and then dna's guardians of the galaxy kind of kind of inches him towards a more light-hearted but only because he has a family and they're all like goofballs but they're still bouncing yeah. on him and he's kind of still rough um but bend is just the way that he writes is you know very quip heavy and everything is a joke yeah it, it was very mcu coded but uh, yeah. I don't know. I feel like, like I it feel like he's help, always but... he's always been that way, though. That should be mentioned. It, it doesn't help that uh, a decent way into the Bendis run, he does end up donning the big brown overcoat. Yeah, yeah, he does. <laughs> they completely synergize that shit. Hey, listen. I mean, I'll say, I'll say right now, like you said it or yourself as a fan of Marvel Cosmic, Brian Bendis. I was actively reading comics when he took over guardians when he took over x-men uh i remember reading guardians for like 
five, ten issues and just hating it. <laughs> I'm uh -huh. like, I hate this. I hate this. Um, I never went backward, but now, <laughs> now I'm here uh, reading these. Um, I think I read for as long as Tony Stark was on the team, and then that. and then I left it alone. And then, as you can see, when you pick this up, they're like closing that arc off with one page. Yes, is that I the mean, one where he where he sleeps with, with Gamora, and it's a traumatic experience for him? Yeah, but what what was what was he even doing with them? I forgot. Was that because he was I, building the Soul's hammer? Or I don't remember uh, what happened, but I rem I if I remember. I remember it just being like something being it. It was described as like something on Earth weren't going so well for Tony, and Tony just had the ability to get away. He had that god armor on. It was really weird. Weird <laughs> times. I hate that book. Oh, uh, it's like that. That was what I remember. He slept with Gamora, and he and at the end of it, he was just like, "What just happened?" Says something about Tony Stark overcoming mind control by a Mandarin and mm. decided to leave Earth for a time and join the Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. Weird, because he was he also to get away. the Illuminati at the time. <laughs> uh, GT, how do you feel about the whole uh, Jason ego change? You know, actually, I'm, I'm glad you asked because it was something I was thinking about uh, while I was at work. And you know, it becomes one of those things where I tell myself, I'm okay with this, if only because sometimes I just like there being two different things to sort of grab a hold of. Yeah. Um, I like that, you know, when I when I when I speak about Star Lord in, in, in the movies, there's this one very clear uh path that his character takes, and that's what the movies do. But like I've got this completely different one in the comic books. And I just like, yeah, cause, you know, sometimes it's okay to not completely adapt everything and just give me something different. Yeah, make it unique. And, and it's fine as long as that different fits what you were doing anyway. Yeah, set on task. Yeah. yeah I, I like um, the idea that his father's I, a piece of, a good and intergalactic piece of trash, and he's yes. like, He's always narrowly escaping capture or assassination. I like that. Do we talk? Do we talk about the lineup for those Guardians right now? Uh, Go for no, it. but we can. Because there's a really interesting character there that I can't. I can't remember where the fuck she's at right now. <laughs> oh, I don't know where she is right now. But it, this uh, is in the cupboard. One of the uh, one of the funniest editorial sort of uh, stories I've heard in quite some time. Because I at the time. I first was introduced to this character in Original Sin. And um, then when that came out of there, I was like, what? I think I've heard of this character <laughs> before, but not from these books. Uh, but you yeah. go ahead, Yogi. What, uh, talk about that lineup. I think it's funny. Uh, so this took place after of Brian Bendis' Age of Ultron, where he ended his big old uh, Avengers run uh, yes. with an event. And he, and. and they talk. They even reference it in this, where he 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 talks about how the timeline was wounded. It's a living thing. It got hurt, and yeah. something shifted from another universe, which is really the idea that Marvel won the rights in a legal battle to this character that didn't belong to them. It was like some kind of deal. This is what Neil Gaiman gave them as part of the deal, and it's Angela. And Bendis takes her from uh, this Guardians, uh, th this. Age of Ultron event and puts her in his Guardians book, and I think they say she's Thor's sister or something yes. like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. What the fuck happened to that? She yeah, just they, disappeared. But she was in Spawn. Yeah, essentially, she comes Spawn. from Spawn. Yeah. Spawn number nine, famous book that people were fucking rushing to get when Age of Ultron came out. I need Spawn number nine. I think it costs like five dollars again. <laughs> but yeah, yeah I they, hate that she, depreciation. Uh, uh, yeah, they, uh, she had went back and forth because they were talking even about like Cogliostro. They were having arguments about whether or not Neil Gaiman was responsible for that character as well, and that character was put in the movie, and whether or not he was supposed to get anything back for that. They, and it became like a tussle between. It was the mentioned in the movie, right? Yeah, it was part of um, it was part Dr. of a deal that, it, it was part of a deal that also got Marvel Miracle Man, Marvel Man, uh, and that's that's something that we really got to revisit mm -hmm. on this show. 
It's in our uh, origin story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and there's also a... somebody who's dressed quite interestingly. Yeah. Very striking image. That uh, uh, gravity is a malleable idea in space. Um, uh, I, I always like the... I, yeah, I always like the version of the story I had heard about that, which is just like the idea that um, Neil Gaiman had basically usurped the rights to Angela from Todd McFarlane and thought the most gangster thing I can do to piss off Todd is to give it to the people he wants it to have the least. Yeah, that's how it felt. That's how it felt. Like it's one thing to just take him away. And I just like, didn't want it for me. I just wanted you to not have it. I'm gonna give him to someone else and someone you're not really, you know, someone you famously slammed the door on and walked away from. <laughs> uh, yeah, so good. So I want you to know that it never had anything to do with me. It was all about pissing you off. Yes, this is a regular Guardians lineup that we know: uh, Gamora, Rocket, Drax, Groot. Uh, Quill and then Angela, and then the X Men are the original five. Yes, A- Angel, Bobby, uh, Marvel Girl, Cyclops, Beast, and X twenty three, and Kitty Pride, who they keep calling Professor Pride. Yes, uh, which brings me great pride. Yes, uh, I like it, Kate. It, it, I, I like Kate getting up in the you know, in the ranks. It brought me great pride to know that I was seeing the beginning of my favorite thing to needle John about when it comes to the Guardians of the Galaxy in the comic books. What, uh, old girl being Star Lord? The, the superior Star Lord. Yeah. Yeah, 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 Kitty Pride. I mean, that little flirtation in this book, I was like, look at these two <laughs> going at it. Ain't no, ain't no Peter. Peter's gone, I guess. But she's into Peter. Yeah. That's her whole thing. Hey, now. Uh, hey, hey. Um, so, uh, elsewhere, King Jason gathers a clandestine meeting of galactic leaders, including the Shi'ar's gladiator, the brood queen. I'm like, who, who invited the roach and the Cree, the Cree supreme intelligence who always make, who always looks uh. to me like what would happen if you ever found, uh, Coolio's body in an ocean. Oh my God. <laughs> is it still, um, this supreme intelligence is still the two Reed Richards, right? There was a two yeah. Reed Richard supreme yeah. intelligence. No. Yeah, fuck I'm, yeah. They got they is killed it, one. Is it, I didn't know that there was an origin story for the supreme intelligence. Yeah, there's, they killed one. And, uh, and I can't remember how this happens, but two, two Reed Richards from the Council of Reeds end up getting merged together and become the new, uh, supreme intelligence for the Cree. So you think- two men became that booger? I think they're still the supreme intelligence. I'm not sure though. We are in the ninth like existence. I don't like any of that. Um, but yeah, it's like all these, all these. He's doing this whole like intergalactic meeting. Um, That's the gang from Infinity, the assholes. Yeah. Yes. The, the the intergalactic assholes. Gladiator reveals that Jean Grey, the young mutant who was who once became the Phoenix, has been brought from the past to the present by the X Men. Despite her innocence in this timeline, the Shi'ar want her to answer for Phoenix's past crimes, and they're planning a covert operation to abduct her from Earth and put her on trial. The others are weary, but Gladiator <laughs> is resolute. Jean Grey must be held responsible. So if you know Captain America is going to stick his shield up your ass, right? Did you <laughs> not? We watched him um, do the thing with the hammer and the sun. We were there. What yeah. What are you thinking? Yeah. <laughs> like I said, I, I, were they just looking for a win? They're like, oh. We just need to do something to get the, the polls back. Uh, this is funny, order. too. Everyone else is like, you do you, bro. Yeah. Mind your fucking... Well, uh, they, all, they, all, like they all at one point say, like, you know that's not the... Re- like, she hasn't done it yet. <laughs> and I guess they'll say it once, but then they won't argue with him anymore. Like, yeah, okay, bro. Well, he is fucking... Yeah. He is yeah. Kalark. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so aboard the Guardian ship, Rocket, Raccoon, Gru, and Drax rep- uh, receive a surprise transmission from Tony Stark. Tony, who borrows some of their tech, warns them about the Shi'ar plan to target Jean Grey. Meanwhile, on Nowhere, the real Gamora and Angela are shopping at the market when they spot a scrawl imposter carrying an incon- unconscious Peter. They quickly confront the scrawl, who tries to fight back, but Angela decapitates without hesitation. 
Uh, Gamora explains to Angela that scrolls are shape shifting zealots, and they reduce the scroll. I'm oh, sorry, they deduce the scroll was working for Peter's father. Uh, one week later, Rocket intercepts a B- Badoon transmission discussing the Shi'ar's plans to capture Jean Grey. Peter's uneasy. His father's involvement usually signals bad news. Uh, the Guardians track the Shi'ar ship to Earth, specifically to Canada. As they prepare to fight, Peter jokes about Canada's cold, distant reputation, and they all sense something is off. When they mm. arrive, they find a group of X-Men in shock, realizing that they're too late to stop the Shi'ar. <laughs> and he's just standing there crying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's like, uh, because they make this like grand entrance and there's, yeah, Gene's already gone. <laughs> so this beast design is weird. Why is he fully beast but with no hair? Like he's, when he, he's not, that wasn't a thing. He just he had seems, big ass feet and hands. He reminds me of um, the Emperor's friend in Emperor's New Groove. I can't remember the guy's name. <laughs> uh, yeah, but the, um, he just got. He just has like large Fred Flintstone s features, like really, really big hands, a big ass head. Uh, <laughs> he looks like a Disney uh, or Shrek when Shrek came back as a human. That's what that's what Hank McCoy looks like in this. Uh, in this Are you ever saying he looked like Smart Hulk from Endgame to me? Yeah, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> I can see that. Um, Hulk Pink. Hulk Pink. <laughs> So we go to uh, an all-new X-Men number 22, which is basically the events from the other side. Um, in the Danger Room, Kitty Pride watches X-23 train while Beast is tangled up in time travel theories in the lab. Outside, Iceman's making snow angels and singing Run DMC. In the mm-hmm. cafeteria, Angel uh, eyes his burger. Cyclops checks on him and Jean Grey joins the table asking about yesterday's near-kidnapping fiasco. Warren's about to take a bite when Jean suddenly snaps at Scott. Uh, confused, Scott argues back, leading to a classic telepathic argument that they always have. Jean reading his thoughts and Scott accusing her of invading his privacy. Uh, Angel's stuck in the middle, wishing he was anywhere else. Uh, Scott uh, is worried about Jean, reminding her that she saw her future self die. Jean's brushing it off, claiming that she's dealing with it. But Scott presses, wanting to be there for her. Jean, frustrated, te- telekinetically flings her food, Ranting about everything she's been through, being stuck in the wrong time, watching her family die, even her future marriage and betrayal. She storms off, leaving Scott to brood in the opposite direction. Awkward silence, and then the angel <laughs> says, uh, Bobby would have loved this. What is the psychological effect of being shown your future? And not only your future, but that you're either made to die or made to kill a bunch of people. Uh, how do you feel I about can't that? even imagine. I can't even imagine. Probably significantly uh, traumatizing. They're already fucked up. I mean, they have to deal with so much. So yeah, it's crazy. And they've been lied to, right? They, I think they've alluded that yeah, they were told the original beasts lied. They to were them. that they were stopping a genocide or stopping an apocalyptic event by yeah. coming in. Oh uh, yeah, it's like oh he no, just, just wanted the old, the, the old yeah. Stone Cold Steve Austin. <laughs> he, he just wanted Scott to see them and be like, oh, I was wrong. This is what I maybe I won't do a genocide. (laughs) Maybe the whole thing. (laughs) The whole thing is a plot to keep young Scott from turning into uh, fascist Scott. No, the first at first it was to show fascist Scott how far he's gone. Yeah, okay. And then they they locked the door by mistake, and then it was like, "Oh fuck!" (laughs) Oh, I can't put them back, beast! You stupid piece of shit! You fuck it. everything up all the time. All I'm the sick time. of you. Sick of you. McCoy. And now he's off. I have this time destroying other Earths with the what? Illuminati. This is the dark. That's beast? what Beast is doing right now. With right the now. Illuminati. Right now. They're busy. What's the Illuminati right now? Blowing shit up. It's the whole McCoy. So who is the Illuminati McCoy? right now? Oh, um, it's it's the originals minus minus Professor X because he's dead and Captain America would have joined yeah. unless they already uh kicked him out. Yeah he's dead. Yeah he he's died dead, in uh dead. in um Avengers vs. X Men. Yeah Cyclops Scott Cyclops. killed him. Scott got him. Bad times. Bad times. So outside Bobby's still singing when he spots three incoming lights. Turns out they're missiles. He throws up an ice shield, but armor beings break through, attacking before he can warn the others. An alert blares. The X-Men spring into action. Cyclops orders them to protect the school. Kitty recognizes the attackers as she are, 
but mm -hmm. they're ready for her phasing tricks. Jean deflects their blast with telekinesis phasing while Beast. Tricks. <laughs> yeah, right. Gina uh, deflects their blast with telekinesis while Beast geeks out over uh, encountering real aliens. Suddenly, Gene and the mm -hmm. others are trapped in energy bubbles, leaving only Iceman free. He tries to fight back, but is captured as well. The CR take Gene and leave. Kitty wakes up to see the them flying off, puzzled. Weren't they allies? Uh, Beast is amazed by the extraterrestrial uh, contact, while X-23 warns that they are not done yet. Lights in the sky signal another arrival, but this time it's the Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, realizing that they are too late. Um, this is, I like, I love the terrifying nature that an alien army can just come, pick you up, and leave. Like, they, they literally, like, the whole fight probably took about 20 minutes. And they were like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, no, got her. No, I got, yeah, no, I know, I know. They're still down there. Give me a second. Okay, yeah, we're heading back. We got her. It's over. Uh, so. Figure it out, y'all. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, Scott Summers, disoriented, envisioning seeing a figure that looks like Jean. Um, so he calls out for her. She appears, asking if he meant the world, the words in his note. Does he truly love her? Before he can answer, another voice interrupts. Suddenly, Scott wakes up, screaming as he realizes he's face to face with a talking raccoon, rocket raccoon. Mm. Rock equips that Scott was about to kiss him, leaving Scott even more confused. Uh, he's probably got some questions about his life. Uh, Scott finds himself aboard a spaceship with the X-Men and the Guardians of the Galaxy. Kitty comments on the surreal turn of events while Gamora introduces the Guardians and explains they're here to help. Iceman is thrilled to be on a spaceship with a talking raccoon, and Beast admits that if the situation weren't so dire, it would be the best day of his life. Star-Lord urges everyone to buckle up as they navigate Earth's orbit while Scott, still on edge, demands to know where Jean is. Uh, Jean awakens in a bubble prison, realizing the horror that she's in space. Gladiator, the Shi'ar Magister, coldly informs her that she's being taken to stand trial for her crimes. Uh, Jean, terrified and confused, protests that she doesn't know what crimes he's talking about, but Gladiator dismisses her, ordering her to be taken away. Despite her efforts to break free, Jean is subdued and left in darkness, feeling helpless. Mm. This is a this is a little bit of a like a trope, right? This idea that you can stop, like you try to stop this person from becoming this monster, but then in turn inform them that they have that ability to become that monster, and then ultimately yeah. they become that monster, right? Because they're like, <laughs> I have to defend myself, and then they they become. It's a self fulfilling prophecy, is what I'm trying to say. Yes, but very much also, so. But there's also the 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 gladiator, like he's just racist against Gene Gray's bloodline. Like he doesn't <laughs> want and no, I mean it. Like <laughs> yeah, he actually is. Uh and I mean this little redhead existing on this earth, I think he just wants it dead no matter how uh no matter how he gets it done. Any 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 Phoenix anything, I don't give a fuck, kill it. Step on it. Later, they allude to, you know, um, what Gladiator does to the to the rest of the grade. When, when was that actually a thing? That's some when fucked that... up. That's some fucked up 90s shit. I never read that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because I got, I, I, it didn't feel recent because I feel like that would have been something I would have been no. aware of. I wasn't aware that, uh, it it like, yeah, we, we need to purge this entire. It might you be know. a Chris Claremont thing. I, I never... Uh, Sound like a Claremont thing. <laughs> okay, so Elaine Gray, Gray is her mom. Uh, her death was in Uncanny X-Men 468 in January of 2006. Nice. And... Well, then. That has the Shi'ar Death Commandos in it. That sounds okay. like the one... 2006. That doesn't sound right, though. So they were they they were hunting people because of the what they consider the gray genome. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, yeah, they were killed. They were going around killing members of her family to make sure that none of them would inherit the uh, the very the destructive Phoenix Force. Um, I like these scenes with Gene. I don't know why. I really like how how they're it really just shows like the emptiness of space the hopelessness of her situation 
Um, mm-hmm. Though her emotions when faced with what she could possibly be or what could be possibly in her future are heartbreaking. Um, and again, yeah, she has no friends in this. They, 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 it's got to be crazy to be talked to like if, if uh, like uh, as if you have committed a genocide when you have yeah. like, that's got to be wild as hell <laughs> where people are looking down at you don't you know what you've done it's like no i really don't <laughs> people keep telling me but i don't fucking have a clue um well, so, yeah. one of my favorite little sci-fi shows is this show called dark matter and it's it's a lot of the weirdness of being um and what the main the entire main cast is like has no memories of who they were when they come out of their little fucking space pods and it's the weirdness of being confronted with like oh you were a pretty shitty person in the past i was like well i don't know who that is right <laughs> yeah we were dealing with all of that with umbrella academy because they were kept changing timelines and it's like they you they mm-hmm. try to they try to make people pay for the sins of what they've done but if they've not you know done it yet or if they're not those people then who are you exactly yelling at yeah um so back on the Guardian ship, Kitty blames herself for not protecting Jean's abduction, while Rocket sarcastically adds that the crimes Jean is accused of haven't happened yet. Cyclops, disillusioned, mutters that their presence in this time was based on a lie. Suddenly, the ship is rocketed by enemy fire. Star-Lord realizes that they've been found by the Shi'ar, despite being cloaked, and the chaos ensues as the ship takes even more hits. Angela, Drax, and group prepare for battle, while Rocket jokes about proposing to Angela after the fight. Huh. Um, <laughs> he's, he's he's really digging what she's he doing. He meant that. Uh, I mean, she walks around the ship butt ass naked all day, every day. That shit is jiggling. He sees it. He knows yeah. where it is. Uh, I think. I, 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 yeah, go ahead, Greg. I, I, I mean, it's funny because, like, yes, but also I feel like like the real thing that pushed him over the top was just like propensity for murder. Yeah, that's yeah, that. That is the that thing. <laughs> there's a scene there where bobby's talking about how talking to this raccoon makes him feel like he's a disney princess and yes. uh beast is like princess and bobby's like oh well, well uh uh what i'd make a better princess than you and yeah but knowing that ben is in, a, in, in i don't know how many more issues away from this is gonna reveal that bobby is gay is right. like this is his attempt at foreshadowing that by having Bobby call himself a princess and then backpedal on it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look at him. he's talking. To, he's talking to Beast, who's just as gay as the next guy. No, he swear he, or he claims just so that he can <laughs> is wallow in his misery. <laughs> um. So we. This is we're talking about um. Uh, all new X Men twenty three, yeah. all new X Men forty is the out the outing. <laughs> is the Bobby you're gay? Aren't you? I'm reading <laughs> your mind and I see. Oh goodness! No. It's, literally, it's literally Bobby. <laughs> you're gay. Oh, so I had no them. idea. Let me thank. Thanks for letting me know. I had no Jeez. idea. <laughs> I guess I'm gay now. Jean just told me I was gay. <laughs> um, she, I also she planted I, that bit. I also am reminded about how demonic Rocket looks with no pupils. I keep forgetting oh, yeah. the comic book character just has, is it red eyes or white eyes? Or my little creature. I feel like he has like a little, yeah, little red eyes. Um, but yeah, he, and I like his, uh, very similar to Lobo, his like space cursing. Mm, I miss making, that a lot. Making up, bu- making up a bunch of words. We don't I have that he was enough. doing it in the first film. It was in the for, first movie he did it, and then they moved away from that shit. <laughs> love it so much. Um, this is like, we know what you're doing. Stop it. Jean <laughs> uh, uh, finds herself in a cold interrogation room confronted by Oracle. Um, I love that later on she's like, the Oracle. And she's like, no, just Oracle. Because I want to say the Oracle. Like, my mind immediately wraps around calling her the Oracle. There's only one Oracle. All right, that's Barbara Gordon. The <laughs> Oracle could be anybody. Um, a Seth MacFarlane show. Yeah. The, the Oracle. The or- oh, famously. <laughs> <laughs> Oracle Redenbach. John's wrong. He knows he's wrong, and I'm not going to correct him. No, no I, I, I. <laughs> Editors know. <laughs> we know. <laughs> it is the Oracle. <laughs> um, 
so yeah, Jean finds herself in a cold interrogation room confronted by Oracle, a telepath from the Imperial Guard. Oracle probes Jean's mind, asking about the Phoenix and whether she understood the legacy she was shown. Jean, recalling the overwhelming images of Dark Phoenix, insists that she has not committed any crimes. Oracle finds it interesting that Jean has no memory of her time as a Phoenix and warns her to control her temper. As Oracle leaves, Jean is once again alone in darkness, trapped and fearful. Uh, I thought this uh-huh. was a, a very affecting scene. But my favorite part is like them r- riling her up and then being like, uh, don't be mad. It looks like a bad look. Like the optics. Yeah. <laughs> the optics. I just, wanted, I just wanted to see if you glow orange. Yeah. I'll be back. Yeah. There's some uh, pink discharge coming from your eyes. You might want to might wanna uh, look into that because that seems to be happening quite often. Um, that's not the discharge. No, that's not. We don't do that. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Ask Bobby about that. But um, oh no, uh, oh no, oh no, cold blooded. Back on the Guardian ship, <laughs> as Angela, Drax, and Groot engage in uh, the Shi'ar ship, another spaceship arrives. It's the Star Jammer. Recognizing the voice of its captain, Corsair, Star Lord orders his team to stand down. The Star Jammer quickly disables the Shi'ar vessel, and Scott Summers is shocked to learn that Corsair, the Star Jammer's leader, is actually boom, 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 his long lost space pirate father, did Major he, Christopher did, Summers. Did he fucking faint? I think he might have fainted. I think he did. I think he might have fainted. God oh, damn it! Very modern. Very modern storytelling there with that. Um, uh, what do you guys think of Corsair as a character? Uh, um, you're a fan of Daddy Clops? It, well, he's a space pirate. Space pirates <laughs> are pretty cool. He gets to bang yeah. aliens. I don't hate him. I, I think uh, I think he's interesting. I like him, actually. Is he made to be like a duplicitous character? Like, Is he made to be like... Shouldn't rely on him too much because he's a fucking pirate, kind of. Well, he is a pirate, but yeah, I don't. I um, know. I'm trying to think of times where he would have been uh, a bad guy. I haven't read any. I don't think. He, he but I'm like sure there are some character in Dodgeball. He has a little bit of that going <laughs> on for him. <laughs> a a global dream guy. Yeah, yeah a white Goodman. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. He's 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 doing a little bit of that. Uh, so See in the cartoon. Yeah, yeah, he's in yeah, the anime so. series. Yeah, he's part of the Phoenix was. Phoenix saga, isn't he? He's in the new one too. What are you doing in the new one? Was he 90, in the fucking ninety seven? Um, yeah, wasn't he in the? No, I'm I'm bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you just sometimes when you're in love, you see Corsair everywhere, bro. You understand? Know I don't blame you. That's what happens. Exactly. Uh, That's interesting. <laughs> We get a bit of an origin story, a little bit of 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 sorts that I had no idea about. Years ago in Alaska, a small private plane is under attack by CR uh, CR spaceship. Inside, young Scott and Alex Summers panic as their mother Catherine tells them to unbuckle and come with her. The boys are hysterical, but their father Christopher, who is piloting the plane, orders them to listen to their mother. Catherine straps a parachute onto Scott, telling him to hold on tightly. Scott asks if she's coming too, but she explains it's only one parachute. As Christopher struggles to control the plane, Catherine hugs her sons, telling them that she loves them before pushing them out of the plane. The boys yeah. scream for her as they descend, and Scott watches in horror as their parents' plane explodes. That I've known the lot. plane. I've known the plane thing, but I can't remember where I first saw it. I want to see it's on the cartoon. Shot down. I feel like it happens a lot. This whole plane getting. This is a story. Just story for Iron Fist as well. With the at least in the show. Oh, no. Where they're in the What's plane. It? This a happens tr- a lot. Those, doesn't it happen? Doesn't it happen to you? Uh, <laughs> no, you're yeah, right. <laughs> um, in Amazing, Amazing Spider-Man too, when they show the origin of the parents, it's a plane situation and it's crashing <laughs> as well. There's a lot of crashing planes, dying parents in Marvel, uh, Marvel lore. Apparently, um, I wish they did more with Alex and Scott. I like the brother. Yeah. Yeah. Camaraderie, if you will. Um. I just looked at your background there, Yogi. It looks like that guy's at a concert. And he's like, oh, 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 he oh. about to do the. <laughs> <He laughs> They're going to hang he's their head. That's yeah. what they said uh, they would do. That's why we're here. He looks like he's ready to hit the whole yeet. 
Yeah, right? Oh, no. Dun, We're dun, 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 dun. decapitation. Decapitation. <laughs> do, you, do you guys remember my uh, Elmo Yeet video that I yeah, did? I, so I posted that on TikTok, and it's got like 20,000 uh, views. Nice. Like, or 1,000 <laughs> likes. A, it's, easily, it's easily the most uh, quote-unquote viral thing I've ever posted, and it's about 15 seconds long. <laughs> That's incredible. Right. Oh, it, that's teaches you, it teaches you something about hard work. Don't do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm like, oh my. And every day, that's, it's just a, a bunch more people being like, yeet. I'm like, uh huh. That's exactly how it's it happens, pro- dude. It's provocative. It gets the people going. Yeah. I, I, I don't question it. Um, so Scott Summers wakes up disoriented, only to find his father, Christopher Summers, alive and sitting next to him. They embrace Scott, barely believing it's real. Rocket Raccoon watching them grumbles, and Scott, star, sorry, Star Lord explains that some fathers actually hug and care about their kids, unlike his own. Speaking of his dad, King Jason is informed by an advisor that the Shi'ar have extracted a young girl from Earth and are proceeding with their tribunal. Jason, frustrated, curses the Shi'ar for their timing. Their advisor reveals the girl's name is Jean Grey. Once the girl, what the advisor reveals, the girl's name is Jean Grey. <laughs> once possessed by the Phoenix Force, though her date, uh, her data shows that she's been dead for some time. Jason laments about being put in this position as he intended to ignore the situation, but now that he knows his son is involved, he feels compelled to act. Um, the Imperial Guard trains as they discuss the missing ship and the potential involvement of the X Men. Gladiator dismisses the idea, doubting the Earthers have the capacity to reach them in time. Oracle, however, warns that by abducting Jean Grey, Gladiator has effectively declared war on Earth's mutant population. Uh-huh. Gladiator insists that they are prepared, but Oracle suddenly accuses him of uncertainty, hinting that he doesn't fully comprehend the consequences of his actions. Uh, what do you guys think of this come to Jesus moment mm-hmm. real here, where Oracle is basically like, you don't know what the fuck you're doing, huh? You're kind of <laughs> just swinging this thing, aren't you? I- I like that they know the X Men so well. She's like, "What are you like? You know damn well you took one of them. Like they're yeah. they're gonna come like roaches. They're all coming here. I yes. thought you were prepared for that. You mean yeah. to tell me that you're not? You think they're not gonna come? <laughs> I, my favorite part is like he she just poises it the other way. She goes, "What if they would have taken one of us? What would you have done?" I I, you know? I love the arrogance of just like. The humans are not equipped with space travel. You've met them. Yes, yeah, yeah. They learn pretty fucking quickly. And also, um, I love the coldness of like, don't you be reading my thoughts. She was like, I don't have to read your thoughts to know that you have no idea what the hell you're doing. I was like, damn. All right, well, you still got to kill a mohawk, bro. They gotta, they gotta, <laughs> they still got to pay attention to you there. But yeah, like this is the first kind of little cracks in the visage of gladiator that this might not be a hundred percent either what he wants or what he believes is right. Um, yeah. So I, I uh, thought that that was really interesting. Um, did I do? Yeah. Uh, as the tribunal begins, gladiator prepares to put Jean on trial for the crimes of the Phoenix. Meanwhile, Scott Summers, still reeling from reuniting with his father, tries to process the situation. He leaves the room overwhelmed, but is followed by X-23, who finds him crying. Despite his mm. protests, she hugs him, offering silent support. Aw. Oh, Laura. Don't they kiss? Uh-uh. I thought they uh, did, but I think it's just a very, a very heartfelt hug. I think hug. it's just a no, nice hug. Oh, not, yeah. not, not, not here. Uh, oh, in, this, oh, in this run, in, this, in, in Brian Bender's X-Men. Oh, I, don't know I, I about actually, that. I actually, I, I vaguely remember a cover with them on it being solicited <laughs> together, and people being like, "What the f- uh, is going on?" They had a kiss on a cover of a, of a yeah, for sure, for sure. A, that was like right? all new X Men twenty, which is not too far from this. Is okay. It? Oh, this is before yeah. this. Yeah, it must have happened already. Whatever it is that happened. Now, who knows if the kiss actually happened. Just Was it also there. all different? They're always I, all different. I, yeah, it's too different. <laughs> Imagine that fucking uh, <laughs> that thing. Too different. Too new X-Men. Fast to Felix? It's too fast. Too fast to Felix. Too fast The two men. Um, so, yeah, I like this camaraderie. 
what I want to ask is, do you guys think by making Scott young, you kind of lose the things that kind of define the character, which I always felt like is like this stoic leadershipness, or is this just another flavor of, of Cyclops? Like, does he it's still a- sound like Cyclops to you get, without all the experience? Or is this just another, you know, like I said, another flavor of the same kind of vanilla ice cream? I think it's supposed to be like, or it shouldn't, it shouldn't feel like regular Scott. But um, it's 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 funny to see that he was always that way. Like, yeah. <laughs> like oh, look, you're still a little cop. <laughs> there's a there's a lot of discussion currently with new with the new X Men line that's coming out that people are yeah, saying that 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 X that that Scott may not 100 percent sound like Scott. I don't. I don't. I don't know. Uh, th- th- from the Ashes sort of books, kind of. He's been think- through so much. Like you can't really. Be like, this doesn't sound like Scott. Like, this sounds like Scott after he's been through all the shit he's been through. This is what Scott sounds like now. Sometimes yeah. that fucking happens. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I thought it was interesting to take him back because now he's somebody who doesn't know everything. And he's a it's, bit more brash and he curses a lot more. Uh, he's funny. I, there, I, I guess I don't know if it's uh, now, but there, there are multiple mentions of him not being, you know, uh, like his adult self. Yeah. yeah. You're very different. He's very whiny. I think that's uh, is that that's all as traumatic as the Dark Phoenix stuff, right? Like being told, oh, by yeah, the way, being whiny? you're in a tremendous oh. you're a tremendous leader. You end up killing your leader. Um and then try to, you know, uh became become a militant arm of the mutant, you know, his, fight for survival. A lot of his a lot of his best stuff, this young Scott, I like the if there's any good thing that came out of Bendis bringing these fucking X Men to the present, it's the champions. You'd want to read champions. Mm-hmm. Yes, you yes, get yes, your yes. young team with Scott and uh, Kamala and Miles and Viv and uh, I forgot who else is on the team, but that's where you want to read some good young Scott. This whiny little bitch Scott is in the way. Actually, <laughs> he fainted. Yeah, and then twice. the champions got broken he up. Sucks. He sucks. The fainting between issues killed me. <laughs> the fainting in between issues. He, he um, ended it looking all epic. And then the next one, he's waking up from a dream. I guess that's why I'm I'm asking, like, do you, does he lose any of the gravitas or coolness from by being uh, like, like, oh, shucks, kind of like, like an, I will fucking kill you. I think he said that, right? <laughs> I will fucking kill you if you come back to this planet. I'll kill you. But they don't cut, like, okay, get out of here, cutie. <laughs> Aww, he got that. You take a. Does he use his eye stuff in this? I was just thinking about it. Uh, I don't remember yeah. like a badass yeah, scene yeah. of him. Yeah, he does. He knocks the shit out of Gladiator with him. Oh, later on when the yeah. Eugene's there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. When 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 when, when he has the opportunity to impress her. Yeah, and then leave her. Be like it's never gonna work out between us. <laughs> 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 Sorry, girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're, we're, we're alive on Dirty Radio. You're gonna get us kicked off the air. Get your hand out of your blanket. You. Yeah, right. Oh dear. <laughs> so at the trial, uh, Dream Gray wakes up in a telepathic conference with Oracle, who informs her that she's being moved to the tribunal hall where she'll be judged. Oracle will act as her counsel, advising Jean to remain composed and not react emotionally to the proceedings, as the CR do not respond well to displays of emotion. <laughs> I like that line because I'm like, I'm fucking pissed (laughs) right now. You're you're telling me I got to cool it. And not only that, but you're going to put me in this energy ball in front of everyone while everyone talks shit about me. And and I'm (laughs) going to kill a bunch of people and then show that footage. And I'm supposed to just like bite my tongue. Um, uh, Jean protests her innocence, but Oracle warns that a show needs to be more convincing. Hmm. Uh, Jean is then transported to a massive hall filled with alien races, where Gladiator announces that Jean Grey is here to stand trial for acts of genocide. As the trial proceeds, Gladiator shows a recording of the Phoenix Force causing the destruction of a star, leading to the annihilation of an entire planet's population and a Shi'ar battlecruiser. He demands Jean's response, uh, but seeing all that footage leaves her horrified and speechless. Uh. The Guardian ship and the Star Jammer approach the Shi'ar throne world encountering a massive fleet of ships kitty pride talking to star lord marvels at the different uh, way of life out here star lord still upset that he didn't reach earth sooner suggests a risky plan to sneak aboard one of the outlying ships 
Jean Grey's trial kicks off with Gladiator laying out the Dark Phoenix's destruction and demanding Jean's plea. She stays silent, which Gladiator takes as an admission of guilt, and I'm automatically like, didn't Oracle just say? What <laughs> 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 the fuck? This is, this, you, gotta, you gotta get a different lawyer, girl. Because this, this whole, uh, this plan is not working. Uh, so, uh, all of a sudden, our boy uh, King Jason of Spartax comes in, calling out Gladiator's blindness and declaring Gene innocent. He accuses Gladiator of not seeing that Gene's just a kid, not the Phoenix. Gladiator hisses that Jason shouldn't be here, but Jason reminds him that he was invited, just like everybody else. He questions if only the Shi'ar were hurt by Phoenix's uh, rampage and points out that Gladiator's people have kidnapped Gene. Jason drops a bombshell. The Shi'ar once invaded Earth and wiped out Gene's family, thinking her lineage attracted the Phoenix Force. Jean, stunned, asks if this is true. Jason argues that if Jean were the Phoenix, she'd be out for revenge against Gladiator. Jean's glare deepens, and Oracle, uh, watching, looks worried. Does this is this even Stevens? How do we how do we how do we measure this? Does Jean That's just Jean need to get a pound of flesh? Yeah. But I'm saying does Jean need to get a pound of flesh? Like, where do you see the scales on on this right now? If I found her apology out. and just let her go. Well, I mean, what what would you do? You know, like, uh, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like, where does this like, you know, you 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 found out that your entire family was killed, but also found out in a past timeline you murdered a planet. So yeah. you call it even here? Do we do we sort of like? I don't think I don't. Think I don't remember no... any of these things happening. So can we just say say that we're cool? <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't think there's no way to emotionally remove yourself from that, no matter how uh, it might look on paper. Like, oh, well, they, well, this is how I'm presenting it to you. You killed my mother. You know, like, yeah. I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. care. Oh, I've seen, seen Civil War. I've seen Civil War. I've seen how that works. I've seen how that works. I like this whole thing of, like, I'm like, Gene's going to get out. She's gonna fucking get out. It's obviously that she's gonna get out, and they're just pissing her off more and more. Uh, you can just see the energy emanating from her, and I just can't wait till she fucking does her little prison break. And later, she straight up does, and it's like, what was I calling parkouring around the, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the alien bu- buildings and shit? Um, so uh, I thought that was funny as well. Um, we, we did that part there. Innocent, kidnapped, uh, worried. Meanwhile, uh, Angela drifts in space. The Shi'ar, unable to ID her, decide to bring her in for a checkup. On the Guardian's cloaked ship, Kitty asks if their plan is working. Star-Lord says it is, while Drax grumbles about needing a more direct approach. The Shi'ar officers find out that Angela is very much alive, and then she kills several of them. (laughs) Uh, Back at the trial, the Guardian, Star Jammers, and the X-Men wait anxiously. Angela, who's just been who just beating up the Shi'ar crew, contacts them. Rocket jokingly proposes to her, but she turns him down, thinking he's too short, and I get it, bro. Huh. I it, get it wasn't King. him. It's funny as hell. I lost my ass off. She said, Rocket, you're too short. She said, it's Gamora. She was like, oh, oh. Well, I'll think, well, I'll think about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. When she learns it was Gamora, she considers it. Um, as the tribunal takes a break, <laughs> they're out at recess. Jean is escorted out in a bubble prison by Imperial guards. Gladiator and Jason argue about the facts, debating if Jean is really just a girl and not the Phoenix. Um, and J- Jason, there's no, he's not being altruistic in this moment. Like he's not trying to help the universe. No, not at all. There's extremely selfish motivations. He just yeah. seemingly is on our side in this moment. It's very he, strange to got, see him as the as voice of reason, I guess, is what, that's what I'm saying. He's got something going on, but helping us, is, it just, just happens to be within that interest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, enemy um, of my enemy kind of situation here. Yeah, this is another one of those moments where I, I am also, uh, I'm also kind of glad you don't have, I don't have that weirdness of adaptation when it comes to Jason. Uh, yeah. Uh, of like, a very, very vivid like voice in my head for Jason because Jason ended up being played by um, Jonathan Flakes in the Marvel in the Guardians of the Galaxy cartoon, who I know generously as, as Star Trek's William T. Riker. 
Is that, like, the, is that the images yeah. you just sent over? And it, 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 it bothers me so much. It was just like, you didn't have to cast the voice actor that looks exactly like him. Yeah, yeah that's pretty, did this that's on pretty, purpose. Yeah, that's, that's that is cool. incredible. That is pretty cool. But like, I like, I, I don't want to see him any other way. I don't want to hear him any other way. That's and that's more thought. I don't think that they looked at the living planet and was like, oh, that's obviously Kurt Russell. Like, look at that. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> look at that face. <laughs> I, know that, I know that face anywhere. That's, that's the guy from. That's the guy from Sean. Yes, look at Snake Pl- Plitskin. Plitskin. Snake Plitskin. Plitskin. Uh, Plitskin. Plitskin. Yogi. Plitskin. All right? Plitz- Plitz- Plitskin. Plitskin. <laughs> Donna and Blitzen. Donna and Blitzen. Um. But... <laughs> Jason. Um, suddenly, Oracle senses something is off. She finds the guards knocked out and Jean gone. Oracle freaks out, blaming Gladiator for pushing Jean too far and possibly waking the Phoenix. She warns him if she can read his thoughts, so can Jean. In space, the Shi'ar Command tell the Guardian ship to head to the Science Command and avoid the Throne City, which is on lockdown because of Jean's escape. Cyclops, desperate to find Jean, urges them to speed up, but Kitty tells him, oh, relax. Uh, Jean, I love that warning. It's like when somebody whispers around Superman, and you're just like, you know, he can hear you, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> also, she's free now, so she can use her powers, right? Yeah. <laughs> the whole thing was that she couldn't because she was in that bubble. Yeah. Um, so in space, the Shi'ar command tell the guard up oh, did that already. Jean, overwhelmed by what she's learned about the Phoenix, is doing parkour across rooftops and hiding in the shadows. I like her little uh, her little cloak. That was funny. This this scene, this page was funny as hell because there's this one bubble that is so out of character for the rest of the art in this book. <laughs> and okay. It's like this minimalistic piece of art uh, just in, in between this page. It's one panel with the shadow of Jean and the phoenix bird. And what page is it? Like, it's, uh, it's, I, I, I don't know. Let me pull up the book. I that feel this like is. I'm vaguely it's remembering. It's X-Men number 24. And oh, I guess you're looking at the book. <laughs> I am. I'm looking at it right now. Uh, I'll pull it up. I'll try to show you guys here so you can have a reference, but you won't be able to see it. Is that when it's like her book. face in fire? Actually, actually, I know what I can do. Watch this. I'm going to make it my background. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, there you it is. clever bastard. <laughs> I, I do um, remember that. Yeah. I do remember seeing that. Yeah, I remember seeing that. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's like, that was like, this doesn't match anything, any of the aesthetic in this book. If I send someone this picture and I was like, this, uh, read this. <laughs> no, and the thing is, like, I thought, I thought this, like, are they saying she still has it in her or she has it in her now? No, they're saying that that's how she feels. She's she thinking feels like of this the demon inside of her that's going to come at any minute. minute. I feel like a monster. Uh, <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> That's the height of music at one point. <laughs> but, yeah, I guess so. All right. <laughs> the heroes in the land. Uh, here, sorry, the heroes land. The heroes in the land. The heroes land in a destroyed city. Star Lord, Corsair, and Kitty fill everyone in. Angela says she can keep track of Jean by scent, but X23 already has it. I thought that was a little badass. I was like, I can find her if I have her sent. And then X-22 is like, I can find her and I have her sent. I was like, damn, Laura, all right? Let's go. Start walking on your hands, all fours. <laughs> figure, <laughs> out <where> this, <laughs> figure out where this girl's at. Yeah. I think a bunch of the audience kept talking about how much they liked her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Peter puts X-23 in the lead and tells Drax to keep her safe. Corsair suggests Scott stay behind, but Scott insists on going. As they head out, Gladiator and the Imperial Guard intercept them. Guardian warns them to choose wisely, but Rocket fires his weapon without hesitation. Uh, the battle heats up uh, with Manta blinding most of the team. Gladiator orders, orders Manta to hit them again if they get up, while he and the rest deal with Angela, Groot, and Drax, obviously the heavy hitters of the team. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, during the fight, Gladiator throws Drax into Angela and Groot. He gets hit with Cyclops' optic blast and taunts Scott. Noting he sounds nothing like his older self, which might have been where I got that meta bit of commentary. Uh, Scott threatens Gladiator. 
Yeah, Scott threatens Gladiator, saying he'll kill him if Gene isn't brought back. Gladiator impressed remarks on the similarity to his older self. Was Scott real quick to tell people he would fucking kill them? No, just consider what he's saying. That's why he's like, oh, bring back Gene or I'm going to kill you. That's like their every <laughs> like, oh, That's the their last every, one. every Thursday. Give me yeah. back Gene. Yeah. <laughs> I think it back. You started going exactly like him. Yes. <laughs> this is all feeling vaguely familiar. <laughs> I li- I like that they uh they they kind of they they went through the whole trouble of revealing gladiators ca- caught them and he's like watch it and fucking rocket just sets off the whole action scene without hesitation. Doesn't give a damn. Yeah. Does not give a damn. Not even close. Um. So Jean steps forward, cutting off the fight. Calmly, she admits Gladiator's claim she is a monster. And then we get into this third act of this uh, story here. Jean yep. faces Gladiator, owning up to Fe- Dark Phoenix's destruction. She admits that the Phoenix will possess her one day, or maybe it already has, turning her into a vessel for its chaos. Kitty Pride tells Jean to step aside, but Jean's glowing with power and insists that she can't stop it, and neither can anyone else. Uh, she argues that punishing her won't make a difference, but because the Phoenix um, won't make a difference because the Phoenix will just find another host. She's telling like some major it, truth it, about it. it. It's all like very true. All of it's like I'm like, <laughs> the oh, Phoenix yeah. is inevitable. Yeah, I'm like, that. I'm like, that was hey. said pretty well. And then the other thing about like, wait a minute, yeah, I don't know what the hell y'all doing. <laughs> like she <laughs> reads everybody's <laughs> mind. She goes, y'all can't even stop it. Why y'all, y'all blaming me? And y'all can't even even if it were to come about, there's nothing y'all could do. So mm-hmm. what 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 are we fighting here? Fighting fate at this point. Um you, you know, as she's saying these things uh, towards the end, she's starting to kind of glow. And I thought yes. someone was taking artistic integrity with the Phoenix. I was like, why is it <laughs> why is it she's pink? Doing, she's doing that like the Godzilla thing. Like she's just, <laughs> just <laughs> it's I turning somebody different was colors. being cute. Somebody just colored it wrong. I was like, what is going on? I will tell you this. I'm getting a bit because I because I read the, a lot of the stories out of order, I am getting a bit annoyed that like something like this would happen, and then somebody goes, "I've never seen that before," and I'm like, "What? What is this? What happened? What just? Because what, what <laughs> they do it in this, right? They're like, oh, 'Oh, you've never exhibited that before.'" And she's like, "Yeah, I think it's new." I'm like, "What? Yeah. What is? What do we? What? What? <laughs> what's going on here?" Well, I she did like kind I'm, of. She did explain it at least. It's said it's, her uh, telekinesis and her telep the are in it's, one. It's uh, psionic. Uh, it's it's psionics. Well, jeans you. never jeans never had psionics. <laughs> uh, I mean that's an interesting take. I mean, if anybody's strong enough to use both telepathy and telekinesis at the same time, it would be yeah, Jean Grey. I mean, and she has been shown to be both, just never both yeah. at the same time. I remember you used to have to like use a code to unlock Super Psionic, and he would be like <laughs> all gold, <laughs> like Super Saiyan. <laughs> okay uh no don't get mad at sonic um so uh yeah she's got some new powers now she faces gladiator um and uh, gladiator prepares to attack but gene unleashes a massive energy blast that knocks him out cold um again this is the heavy hitter of the shiar the whole shiar crew so everyone's like oh damn everyone's like oh shit uh, the others are taken aback, wondering if this is Phoenix or something new. Oracle tries to intervene, but Jean, combining her telepathy and telekinesis, is redirecting everyone's psychic energy back at them. Oracle is stunned by Jean's new abilities, which Jean admits she's still mastering, but she finds exhilarating. Anytime oh. Jean is, seeming ha- is seen having fun at this godlike level, it always worries me. <laughs> that certainly uh, can't come back around to fight. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. This this childlike joy with mind manipulation. Um, <laughs> Gladiator rushes at Jean and they clash violently. Star Lord catches Jean as Oracle telepathically commands everyone to stop fighting. Uh, Cyclops demands they leave. Is this the part where it's yeah, yeah, where um, they're like, you don't get to pick when this fight is over. And Cyclops <laughs> like, yeah, I I do. It's over. Like we're we're packing it up. We're going. Don't fucking follow us. You saw us come all the way over here for one person. Don't make this a thing. I'm like, ah, I like that. I kind of like that, Scott. Um, he threatens to unleash the uh, full might of Earth's heroes if the Shi'ar come near Earth again. Does he say something like, um, 
Like he starts he's like I'm gonna send Asgardians, Hulks, X Men. Yeah, and he's like he threatening said, every every fucking yeah. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, he said a hellstorm of Asgardians, mutants, Atlanteans, and Hulk monsters. <laughs> uh, the uh, he said the entirety of the mutant race, the Avengers, the Fantastic Four. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, it's um, something to be scared of. I like that whole threat of like we will roll deep on your ass. But I, <laughs> I like the threat more because I don't believe it. I think if half of those people were told that Jean Grey was on another planet, they'd be like. I mean, Again? <laughs> I mean, can we figure out how to leave her there? Is this the is worst thing? thing? Is it an option? Can we build a will, cage around that will planet? The, will they take more? Oh people? man, we have some more yeah. people we like to send to the Shi'ar. Fucking okay, hit it with the Dyson sphere. Yeah, they're over it. Um, so, uh, yeah, he's like, yeah, get away from here. The gladiator fuming is told to stay away. As Gladiator flies off, he asks how many star systems the Guardians can battle simultaneously. Peter guesses seven, but they're told that they've made a bad choice. Gamora watches thoughtfully while Rocket aims at, aims at Gladiator, but is stopped by Gamora, who says they've won and they need to leave. Yeah, he's still trying to shoot him out of the sky. Um, <laughs> during their departure, Rocket worries about potential Shi'ar retaliation, but Peter assures uh-huh. them that the Shi'ar won't risk crossing paths with his father. Trask compliments X-23 on her claws. Uh, I love that he's like, oh, I like your boots. That they have like that, like modification. She's like, oh no, that's my feet. Like that's that's, that's, just what, that's how my feet are. How my feet be. Um, Hank and Angel check on Jean, who feels energized and excited about her new powers. Angela expresses concern about the broader issues with the Shi'ar and Thanos still out there. Gamora acknowledges they did the right thing, but is worried about future dangers. And Groot reminds them that today's victory is significant because that's what Groot's all about. Um, back at the X-Men base, the Guardians prepare to leave. Kitty thanks Peter, who gives her a communication device for emergencies and casual chats. Kitty is moved and kisses him before heading off. He's the Guardians like, said, this thing cut you off. Boots. No, yeah, I wanted to talk <laughs> about this in particular. Go ahead, uh, GZ. I, I, I can't remember. Uh, but since you brought it up, I, I, I was wondering if we had gone up to the... Uh, to to Groot's grand soliloquy that he cannot translate. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he's just going. He's just going off, and uh, no one really, no one really's picking it up. I think that might be where he where he where he tells him about the, that the, today's victory was significant. No, there's a whole one. I think I think he's kind of just telling Kitty Pride how like significant she is. Oh well, no, he, no. He's got this. Is that the Jean Grey one? Vertex. Oh, the Jean Grey is it Jean? That's a Jean Grey one, yeah. Yeah. Because Jean is reading his mind, and so because she's reading his mind, there's a she can hear everything that he's saying, but then there's a little eye inside the eye. Like Jean, <laughs> yeah, it's like Jean, you are an ex- exceptional human. And what I love about humanity is that <laughs> you are humanity is, yeah, humanity is you know it's the spark of life that ignites the universe, and it's all just I am. I am Groot. Yeah. Um, Jean might be a good guardian of the galaxy. I might have to send it, keep her ass in space. But um, a few people would agree. Yeah, maybe not with the guardian part, but with the keep her ass in space. Keep her ass in space. Back in the that's a t-shirt. Back at the X Men base, the guardians prepare to leave. Like I said, um, and yeah, they kiss. They get a uh, um, a nice little kiss. Do is that relationship looked up upon fondly? Is is. is uh... Kitty as Star Lord, uh, like a thing, or is this was just like a more like a fling, more like an Emma Frost, Tony Stark? Did they get married? Married? I know she takes yeah. the mantle. My <laughs> understanding is that the relationship takes a poor turn once. Um, uh, Star Lord <laughs> once still takes his position in Spartax as prince. Yeah, but I just remember that he proposed. Sure. So, so, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, the Black Vortex Omega number one is Star Lord proposes yeah. to Kitty Pride. Okay. Um, and then, as I'm reading, because I'm reading this from Reddit, because Reddit is, you know, the voice of the people. Yeah. says, that was not Star Lord proposing. It was Bendis using Star Lord as a mouthpiece while proposing. Oh, shit. <laughs> the, the man's got a weird fondness for Kitty. <laughs> and that was the boy. Fair, a lot of writers have a weird fixation on Kitty. 
<laughs> oh boy. Well, well there. Well then. <laughs> That's loaded. Everyone wants a little bit of kitty. Um, oh dear. I like I mean they eventually wrote this whole thing. She ends up becoming her own captain. She goes becomes a pirate, just not a space pirate. Yeah. You know, yeah. Later on. Miss Kate. She even wears she even ends up putting on the the uh the quote Star Lord outfit. Yeah, she rocks them them the helmet, doesn't she? The yeah. helmet and the boot and the brown overcoat. Yeah, he threatens to use his ottoman gun once. I like that moment when we had it under the table. He's like, "You're a fucking squirrel. I'll fucking kill you." But um, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I like I like Kate, and I like I like this little uh, this little Miku. He he wrote this well. I I was rooting for them in this moment. Mm. Um, the X Men invite the Guardians to stay, but they're like, "Nah, hell no. This is way too much going <laughs> on." And and Rocket <laughs> has a Rocket has literally a uh, existential crisis because actual raccoons show up. He's yeah, like, yeah, we need we need to fucking go. This is not this is not, this is not cool at all. I'm being not like on multiple, on multiple fronts, and and there's also trees here, and then none of them talk. What the hell? What, what kind of weird? Bro, no, for, Groot was trying to fuck them. If you remember he? at the end, he was trying to fuck the trees. Rocky kept telling him, "No, you can't yeah. get weird with the trees. You got to stop yeah, getting yeah. weird with the trees." Yeah, his fascination, quote unquote. That's what they call it now. Um. Sky Cyclops drops a surprise. He's going with his dad, which shocks the team. Kitty protests, but Cyclops explains that it's his dad, and he hopes for a happier future. He says goodbye, asking Laura to have it. the team. Yeah, right. The star. Hey, I'm looking for a happier future with my renegade space pirate dad. <laughs> you know. Uh, he I don't know a lot of terrible things about him. Yeah, right. Uh, and then I'm stuck with him in outer space. Um, he says goodbye, asking. Excuse me, Laura, to look after the team. The Star Jammers and Guardians depart. Mm-hmm. Angel, Angel wonders what happens if they find a way back without Cyclops. Uh, way back to their time without Cyclops. Inside, Jean sits in the snow, her eyes glowing ominously as the scene ends. What do you guys think of Cyclops trying to, I guess, take back power, uh, rewrite history, considering all he knows about his fate with Jean? Well, I guess just a kid who wants to be with his dad. I don't know if he thought about it that far. I don't know how much. I, I, I don't guess know I bring that up because wait, wait, I guess I bring that up because what he tells Gene later on, because well, he like, like oh, has a heart to heart with her about. Yeah, he's like, you know what happens to us, so maybe this is make sure that this isn't what. He's happens so to dumb. Us. All he does is keep. Ma- all he's doing is making it worse and worse and worse every fucking time he talks. He's just, <laughs> he's just as dumb as the old Cyclops. So this is this is fine. What's but Jean's, younger, bro. Maybe a little dumber. What's Jean's reaction here? How do you guys read it? She flipped. The, she pissed off. Everything keeps going wrong, even when it looked like it went right. She lost Cyclops out. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I'm, I'm, are, is the, are they supposed to be together at this point as well? They crush on each other, and then okay. you know. They, they cross on each other, but they're, they're, they're repelled by the idea that if they continue to cross on each other, that they'll die or Gene will die. No, I mean, you mean, you mean like just originally? No, that's what age. I'm saying. They, yeah. they, they were crossing on each other, and then they found out where they go if they went down that route. They found out what their future selves do, and it's yeah. a very big, you know. It's like, oh, man, I like you. I, the, I like oatmeal cookies. I never had an oatmeal cookie before. In 20 years, you will choke on an oatmeal cookie. <laughs> and it's like, oh, uh, uh, you know what? I think I'm going to put these down for a while. I'm really going to make sure that doesn't fucking happen. And of um, course, like, any oatmeal cookie you see is like, is this the one? Yeah, yes, yeah. Right? This is going to be the, this. Today's the day. <laughs> this is not again. It's been like, like that really logic would just make me eat more oatmeal cookies. Like, fuck it. It's going to happen. Yeah. It's like, I'm sure just went knee deep in it. So it was I, may good. Well, I may as well, as you say, take back control of it. Like, now nah, I'm just going to eat oatmeal cookies forever <laughs> until, yeah. until I no longer fear the oatmeal cookie. And what a, that's like a, a very shitty fuckboy breakup that he did. Yeah, I'm just going to go with my dad. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you be yeah, honest, I, you know. <laughs> it was cool. Absolutely. We, were, we, absolutely, were right? we rescued you, right? You, you, you're good. Do you got any scratches? <laughs> any bugs? <laughs> you good? I'm gonna go with my dad. You guys gonna drive her home? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You gonna stick around and see if she had any trauma or anything? 
He don't know how they get home from where they at in Canada. I think where they dropped them off. Um, Bobby's still making snow angels and shit. Like no one, no one's paying attention. But I love that whole like almost like what if we do? Because their whole thing is about find, finding a way to go back to their time. So I love this idea of like what if we go back and Scott's not with us. <laughs> like we just yeah. Like, we just leave him here. Um, I am not aware. Are any of you gentlemen aware of how they fix this? Do they die? Uh, no, I think they get sent back. If it, or, I, they do get sent back. I just can't remember when. Yeah. Well, did my camera die? God damn. It might have. Yeah, yes, it did. Uh, it, it, we're officially at the end of this comic, so it's not. It's not it's too okay. crazy. <laughs> um, time displaced team. They do. They uh. I'm trying to remember what what event like what boy that when? sounds complicated something about mimic sacrificing himself ahab oh jeez uh ahab? ahab's ha- ahab's hounds <laughs> uh and the whale as a result once the team returned to the past just after beast had departed with their past selves gene was able to wipe the memories of their time in the future timing them to reappear in their present selves just after the younger team departed thus restoring gene's memories of how to undo the twins brainwashing on the hounds i have no, i just read that i have no idea what i just said ah, uh the mystery uh, yeah i know i understood that totally that that did, didn't you come on come on <laughs> easy <laughs> this is why I need infographs. Damn it. <laughs> a better man would have made an infograph and made it real, real easy for me to understand what the fuck is going on. Um, But yeah, I thought that this was a fair, a fair story. I like that we've been covering stories of X-Men's different, uh, you know, uh, time periods. You really get to see how much this team changes with different writers um bendis mm-hmm. at one point was the kingmaker over there for a very long time um with these titles and uh he definitely has a flair for his writing i don't know if his writing works for everybody it definitely works for the younger class which makes more sense with them these being the younger x-men and stuff but um what did you guys think of the story overall i guess it was cute i thought it was a fun little story uh fun little crossover of all the books that he had going on at the time uh you read trial of gene gray and you think it's gonna have all this gravitas but it's mm-hmm. really just a, a fun little superhero story from bendis uh quippy uh nothing really to bite into but it didn't suck either yeah 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 i i i did the, i exactly what john said i actually did expect something a little bigger because of like Ooh, the trial of Gene Gray. What are we gonna get into? Like, it's, it's we're not gonna get into much, actually. And I, I guess one of the things we should have said up front is like this is a big kind of uh, picking up of breadcrumbs dropped during the original Dark Phoenix story, right? Wasn't that a big point of contention? Her judgment of what she had done, uh, this idea that she had genocided the whole planet. Um, I think at one point she was going to still live, but Claremont wanted her to die for her sins or something yeah, along those sure. lines. Um, but, or vice versa, he was going to put her on trial and they were like, no, she needs to die because she killed all those people. And yeah. like, Damn it. <laughs> I love it. I love the idea that like, like Claremont's like, yeah, I've got this whole story. And then like, you know, this, this Jean Grey character that nobody cares about will die for her sins and all that. Like, no, 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 no. Yep. See, Chris, you done fucked up and you done made money. Yeah, you know, now we yeah we can't turn off that faucet. You yeah, have finally so. made in, in your in your haste to kill off this character that has been misused incredibly. You have actually found a way to make her profitable, <laughs> and now she can never die. No, no. Um, yeah, it says. Uh, John Byrne worked with Chris Claremont to effectively remove Phoenix from the storyline initially by removing her powers. However, Byrne's decision to have Dark Phoenix destroy an inhabited planetary system in Uncanny X-Men 135, coupled with the plan ending to his story arc, worried Jim Shooter, who felt that allowing Jean to live at the conclusion of the story was both morally unacceptable, given that she was a mass murderer, and an unsatisfying Mm -hmm. ending from a storytelling standpoint. Um... 
according to him, I personally think, and I've said this many times, that having a character destroy an inhabited world with billions of people, um, wipe out a starship, and then, well, you know, having the powers removed and then let go on Earth, it seems to me that it's the same as capturing Hitler alive and letting him go <laughs> on Long Island. Uh, now, I don't think that the story would end there. I think a lot of people would come to his door with machine guns. And that's basically what this story is. You know, them trying to make her mm. pay for pay for the crimes of her past, even though it's not happening. Yeah, yeah. It's always very interesting how editorial affects these things and how some writers in the future will pick it back up and kind of address it. So I like that this kind of closes that loop there. This is the Rogue One of the Dark Phoenix saga. Like, there, yeah, she's had a trial. We've seen it now. <laughs> then basically the results of her trial was she was like, fuck off. Don't no one, don't, don't ever come <laughs> to my door or my lover will kill you. So yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's good to know there. Um, but that's all I have. Are you guys I have any lasting impressions? Anything else you want to talk about? Get off your chest for this story. No, I got no? confused. I was confused. Uh, I I forgot there were two fucking Bendis X Men Guardians crossovers: the Black Vortex and then the Charlie Jean Grey. I thought this was the one with the uh, high evolutionary. Uh, Is that okay. after this? Uh, yeah, well, it would have to be, right? Because I just yeah. said that Black Vortex is when they proposed to Kitty. So. <laughs> uh, That's why you sent me that text. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, well, the next time we get on this podcast, we will be covering The Shadow, which I have never seen. It is the 30th anniversary of that film. Uh, I think a Baldwin's in oh. it. So uh, I'm hoping to like some of that pulpy oh. pulpiness. I have absolutely no background on The Shadow. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see that. We'll be finishing up. Like we have, I have about three to four more shows left on the current schedule. And then we'll be scheduling mm-hmm. out for the rest of the year. And then adding things, obviously, like Cape Crusaders, um, uh, My Adventures with Superman, maybe even The Crow, if I could find a good enough copy and do not have to spend any money. Yeah. I, I have to see. I have to see it. It's it, how bad. Like we've covered some I, of the I don't know worst how you... things, man. We've covered some of the worst things on this. How bad could it be? How bad? I really want to know. Uh, yeah, and also, well, I also know that the crow is famous for having very, very shitty sequels. Like there's been like five sequels to this to the original film, plus a uh, uh, live action series. Um, mm. So, uh, and considering all those flew under the radar, I'm assuming they're though all of those were terrible as well. So um, I think that that's interesting too, but yeah, that'll be that's what we're covering next time on the Major Issues Podcast. You can find everything that we do as part of the Major Issues Podcast at comicbookclick dot com, which is also where everything Comic Book Click does. That's our merchandise, everything. articles written by us. Over three hundred and forty episodes of the podcast exist over there. So you'll really to get to our T Public uh, store, which will help us, you know, you could buy a piece of merchandise and then we get a kickback from that. You just got to hit that shop CBC link there. Um, other ways you could support us. You can go to patreon.com slash CBC clubhouse. And for as little as 10 cents a day, $3 a month, you could keep, keep, help us keep our lights on here and afford the hardware and the software that we need to keep providing content free of charge. Uh, we're a bit late on this month's major previews series, but it will be coming out. We've record, we double recorded for, uh, August and September. So we got some very exciting picks. In the for, can. Yeah, for some new comics that will be coming out that I'm excited about. So just make sure you guys are paying attention to that. Major Issues comes out every single Thursday. Uh, we do the live spontaneously, but it's really cool if you guys can engage on, in on the lives. Uh, we're at Facebook.com slash Comic Book Click, Instagram at Comic Book Click, and we use the hashtag Comic Book Click to talk about the news, how ladies and various things. It comes to Comic Books, Comic Book Media. Um, uh, we love what we do, and we're trying to extend our reach through social media, we're having a hell of a year ever since we partnered up with the juggernauts over at Dirt Sheet Radio, who we are also currently roommates with over at comicbookclick.com. Woo! Those guys over there, according to Werner Herzog, are tremendous in professional wrestling and pop culture. <laughs> so just make sure, just make sure that you guys are checking out what they're doing over there too. They're doing a lot of cool stuff uh, over there. And that is is all um, hosted and, you know, founded over there by Mr. Jonathan Escudero himself. Do you want to go ahead and do your plug, Zabrowski? Yeah, man. Jersey Radio, we're on, always on, every single day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and this weekend, Saturday and Sunday. So that's seven days straight. Get us. <laughs> not, ex- not exhausting at all. 
Not 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 no. not, not even in not even in the slightest. And you know what I've always said here, and I'll find a way to get it perfected so we can put it on a shirt. But uh, you know, just turn on the dirty radio. Something's always on. You know? <laughs> something's, always, something's always on. So Stay tuned to everything that's going on with Dirt Sheet. Stay tuned to everything that's going on with Comic Book Click. Like I said, we're still trying to come up and innovate new ways and new uh, uh, ways to give you guys content and create the conversation around this stuff because that's why we do this. That's why we do the Major Issues podcast. That's why we do major previews. We love talking about this kind of stuff. Uh, so we're looking for more ways to kind of engage you guys, maybe another live show where we just cover news. Um, so we're considering other avenues for this stuff. But the only way to find out where we're going is to follow us wherever we are. So I gave you guys our links to our socials. All that stuff is in the show notes as well. Uh, consider, like I said, checking out Dirt Sheet Radio. That will also be in the show, uh, the show notes. And we will see you guys next week. Um, GT, where can they find you if you want to be found? Uh, just just hit up the guys over at Dirt Sheet Radio. And, if you know, sometimes I... I'll respond there, and it will be filtered through John. Cool, cool, cool. Same thing with you, uh, Yogi. Yeah, just follow Dershey Radio, Google it, or follow John Escudero on Facebook. Like I said, you want to do this, guys. We are the Babe Ruth rookie card of podcasts of companies. <laughs> you want to get? You want to have us now? Wow, you don't even know our value. And next thing you know, we skyrock. And get on the bandwagon before the bandwagon gets full. Because if the bandwagon gets full, then you're in the back. And no one can hear you, bro. I can't even hear you. You know what I'm You had an opportunity to sit right next to us. Uh, then we start big leaking people when we have 10 million, thousand, 100 people. So, you know, can't get wait. in the bandwagon. Yeah, John started a long time ago. It's good. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. I've been to the future where we become the latest, greatest things to come to comic books and comic book media, but I can't tell you how we do it because they'll mess up the timeline. And next thing you know, The Rock wants to make a monster truck movie for Disney for some strange reason. And no one oh wants to see that happen. Uh, or we will be living in the worst timeline. So make sure that you guys are following all of us with all the things that we do. It's all labors of love. And we'll be bringing you more of that love next week. But my name is George Serrano, a.k.a. The Don. This is I Jonas Guerrero. Uh, same <laughs> flow as last time, John. I went second. Uh, I forgot. <laughs> I'm Gregory Thomas, aka GTV Rose. I'm John Escudero, and I fucked this whole thing up. <laughs> and this <laughs> has been our trial of Jean Grey recap and review. And remember, whether you have telekinetic powers, can shoot optic blasts out of your fuck. eyes, have foot claws. <laughs> Or just want to murder a little girl for a genocide. Remember, oh my God. hey, that's a character in this. Remember that we are the click. And always remember that you, yes, you are worthy. 